that our rights are inalienable and come to us from our Creator. Not only does federal law recognize that, but the whole American experience recognizes the natural law as the ultimate source of our freedoms and as a restraint on the government. Thus, the traditional panoply of American rights is ours by birthright and cannot be interfered with by an act of the Congress or an order of the President, but only after due process. One of those rights is freedom of contract. Any law changing the terms of a contract is no law at all because it violates the natural right to make binding agreements. The framers knew that. The Constitution specifically forbids the states and the federal government from, quote, impairing the obligation of contracts. This is a personal natural right that pre-existed the constitutional clauses that bar the government from interfering with it. The whole purpose of the Constitution, my friends, is, was, and has been to define the government, to impose restraints on the government, and to guarantee personal freedoms. It specifically diffused power between the states and the central government and within the central federal government itself. It separated powers among the three branches. As elemental as this sounds, it is hardly recognizable today. After 230 years, we have come to a point where a president declines to enforce laws he has himself signed into existence, where he directs his treasury secretary to make laws interfering with private contracts, and where he signs executive orders that invade privacy, restrict speech, and appropriate property. We have a Congress that delegates to the president its power to spend taxpayer dollars and money borrowed in the taxpayers' names. We have a Congress that has written laws that regulate the air you breathe, the water you drink, the words you speak, and relieving the persons with whom you have contracted or to whom you have loaned money from complying with their agreements. And our courts have raised taxes, run prisons, reset the boundary lines of school districts, and declined to write obvious constitutional wrongs committed by the other branches. But the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. We will have chaos if those in whose hands we repose it for safekeeping intentionally violate it and get away with those violations. Because a government that violates its own supreme law becomes arbitrary. An arbitrary rule becomes authoritarian. An authoritarian rule will trample our freedoms. Just six weeks into its four-year term, the Obama administration and its allies in Congress, just like the Bush administration and its allies, have acted like they never read the Constitution. They have attempted to control the salaries of private banks, change the terms of private mortgages, enter the marketplace by nationalizing banks and the world's largest insurer, and invest in taxpayer dollars in companies whose products consumers reject and whose investments investors eschew. This is theft of liberty and theft of taxpayer property. Here's my question, and my panel is here ready to address it. Is freedom a reality or a myth? Are the rights guaranteed in the Constitution real or just a pretense? Isn't the whole purpose of the government in a free society to uphold freedom rather than to, inter to interfere with it? If the answers to these questions are no longer obvious, it is because we now have a central government whose only self-acknowledged limitation is whatever it can get away with. Andy Levy, my Fox News colleague from Red Eye, it is nice to see you while the sun is shining. Me too, Judge. Mark Skosen, who has championed individual liberty, forgive me, since I was in college, <laughs> joins us, and my good buddy and fierce defender of the free market, Cody Willard is also with us as well. Thanks for having us. And Lou Rockwell of LouRockwell.com and of the Von Mises Institute is here as well. Lou, Mark, Andy, Cody, welcome to Freedom Watch. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Did I go overboard or do we have a central government, we'll start with you, Lou, who, well, whose only self-acknowledged limitation is whatever it can get away with? Judge, there's no, no question they consider that everybody's income and everybody's property is what they allow us to keep. And if they decide to take more of it, then they can take it. So they, it's absolutely true they see no, some, no limit on their power. If the framers were to come back and look at this government today, they wouldn't recognize it. I mean, it's not 
we don't live in a free society by the standards of the Constitution and, uh, and of the framers. So it's, you know, the, this thing is entirely run away. Nobody's property is safe. Nobody's freedom is safe. And Obama is, of course, building on, on the dictatorial Bush regime, is making things worse. Does anybody care, if anybody in the government care about freedom, Mark, or is the government just concerned with power? Our Ron Paul will be here in 15 minutes, yeah. and his allies in the House, and occasionally an ally here or there in the Senate. Are they lone wolves? Are they shoveling against the tide? Well, let me just first say that it is a pleasure to be on your program. This is the first time that I've been on uh, your program, Freedom Watch. I think it's a great title, and uh, I have loved your work uh, on Fox News, and I've heard you speak and so forth, and it's a real pleasure to, to be here. And I, and I want to first say uh, a little quote. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, in the Declaration of Independence, we see we, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And actually, the original words that Jefferson wrote were sacred and undeniable. And guess who scratched him out? Ben Franklin, who said, we want it. It's just self-evident. One of the see? big government, one of the original <laughs> big government types. Well, that's right. That's right. And But, you know, this battle that you're talking about has been going on for years. And I'm not sure FDR didn't do worse things than what Obama is starting to do. So I think we need a little bit of history here and not... Uh, I'm not sure we've really gone down as far as uh, what FDR went through, which was pretty dramatic, where he actually closed the banks and, and uh, he ripped up the contract we had regarding the gold standard. I mean, there's a lot of things that he did also. Are my, are my fears about government interfering with contract, are they well grounded? I mean, if the government can interfere with a contract, then, then nothing nothing is sacred. No property or liberty is safe. Judge, you know, actually, I, I disagree with you on part on, on specifics out of this. I think in principle we agree, and that is I think we basically got on anarchy once we instituted welfare for Wall Street. Once we actually took a trillion dollars and gave it to Wall Street, the companies, the shareholders, the guys on the opposite side of AIG's contracts, that was anarchy. That uh, that basically, those companies were insolvent. Those every contract, every loan that they had made out, all of that should have been enforced. It still should be enforced. And I guess this is where I get confused. I think that once we actually gave AIG welfare money, they became a welfare institution, and nobody in that company should make any more than anyone at the Health and Human Resources Division <laughs> at welfare. That's right. It's a government agency now. It is now a government agency. <laughs> so I want the government in there canceling those contracts because those contracts couldn't even be paid you, you know without the welfare you, infusion you, from me. That's I, already anarchy. I, I, I think your tongue is in your cheek. And I am taking this with a proverbial grain of salt because you know what happens when the government runs a business like oh, yeah. the post office. But, the government, but Judge, the government chose to run the business. The premise itself, once the government became, once they made AIG a welfare institution, I do want the government to run it. Before I go to Andy, I, I was uh, in studio uh, with Neil Cavuto at, the, at his 6 p.m. Fox Business show last night. And yeah, while excited. waiting to come on, they have all kinds of screens of other shows there. And one of the other shows was Jim Cramer. Now, I couldn't hear what Kramer was saying, but they flashed underneath the identity of a phone caller to Jim Kramer, and the phone caller was Cody from New Mexico. Was that you? <laughs> there are, believe it or not, there are problems. Or is this going to get you in trouble? There are, I, I, for the record, I, full disclosure, I mean, I, I've worked for Jim Kramer at the street.com. Oh, you did. Mine. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm not going to wow. defend, and I've, I've actually made fun of the whole concept of fast money slash mud, mad money Good on my you. show personally it's for years. It's a disgrace. That being said, <laughs> it was here. All right. But that being said, there are three other Cody's from New Mexico. Out of the 18 people who live in New Mexico, three of them are three of them are Cody. So there's one of the so others. So wait a minute. There's you a Cody, Wyoming. I mean, after you all. made fun of Jim Cramer for his theatrics on the show you, you do from a bar. That is, <laughs> I, Just I so it's clear. No, I did not make in fun Wyoming. Of the, I, I did not make fun of the theatrics. Lou Rockwell. I wasn't making fun of the theatrics because I'm all for theatrics. Okay. If Andy's show is is a little bit past your bedtime, uh, Lou. Andy is not only a sound, solid, super libertarian, he is also the master of irony at the Fox <laughs> News channel, and we're so happy to have him with us. Andy, weigh in on all this. Well, I just, am, I, am I seeing monsters under the bed poster? Are these real problems to worry about? Um, you're not. Alex Jones scares the hell out of me. <laughs> but, but, I, but you're absolutely right. 